and we pray. Heavenly and gracious Father, we praise you for this day, a day that you have made, a summer to remind us that no matter what valley we find ourselves in, no matter what mountaintop, we live in the victory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which overcomes all things. Help us now learn and grow in your word that we may evermore trust to turn to you in the midst of calamity. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to be seated. And so it's been 11 weeks throughout the summer. It's kind of hard to believe, and I'm not sure I would if it wasn't 50-some degrees this morning when I woke up, and not to, to freak you out, but it's not, it feels like, well, it feels like hunting. So that's nice. As we uh, approach this end of our sermon series here, though, and as we kind of wrap it up, what today's message will be is the same as every message has been in every sermon, that no matter what we face in life with calamity and with uh, distress and anxiety and all the rest, that we do so in Christ and we turn to Christ and we lean upon Christ and his gifts. And so, um, I want to start here by just reading you a quote from this book in the last chapter titled, Christ is Your Victory. For those of you who haven't had a chance to read it, I wanted you to hear a little bit more, and this is in the last chapter. And it says, It isn't easy to keep on keeping on in times adver in of, of adversity or uncertainty. It's so very easy to lose heart in the life of faith. Losing somebody you love will do that to you. So will losing a job, losing a marriage, or losing your honor and reputation. Based only on what you see, you wonder if God has left you. All you can see is misery and darkness, an aging body perhaps, a future of uncertainty, an endless landscape of hopeless pain. You begin to think maybe God's gone on an extended vacation or somewhere else in the universe because in your corner of the planet, he's nowhere to be found. I thought that was a beautiful description of what it feels like sometimes in the valley, in these low moments of life. I pray that you're not in one now. But my guess is that you know what it's like my guess is that most of you have lived enough life to have these moments, to wonder, is God really there? And for us, and it's said often in this book, this is hard. This life is hard. It is full of all kinds of struggles. And while we celebrate the joys, and there are many of those too, sometimes these hit us hard. And for us then, it is easy to conclude that we are alone, that there is nothing there for us, that life is hopeless, that it's short, that it's futile. In fact, the wisdom of the world will come up with this every time. We kind of talked about that last week. That that's the best that we, on our own, apart from him, can come up with. But God's promises and his actions speak a different story. And that's what you've heard over and over and over throughout this sermon series. At least that was the goal. That you would hear over and over and over that God had something else in mind. Just a few scripture passages, and there are so many, it was hard to, to kind of weed it down. But we know God's promises because they are spoken to us by the apostles. And the apostle Peter in chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, says to us, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. And then, these words, which you've probably heard most recently at a funeral, would be my guess, because we read this often at a funeral, are the words of Jesus himself, who is speaking to his disciples, and this is before he has gone to the cross. This is before he has given his life and sacrifice. And he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, 
what I have told you, that I go to prepare a place for you. And then these words, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Keep in mind, he spoke this to his apostles who had not yet experienced his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and then the life of martyrdom that all of them except for John here suffered. He knew what was coming for them. He knew the valleys that they would face. He knew the deaths that they would suffer in his name. And so he gives them that promise that he will come and bring them unto himself. And then there's the promise from the Old Testament. When, jo uh, when Joshua is about ready to take over from Moses, these powerful words that Moses speaks to him, a reminder in the midst of the transitions the anxieties that come with them. Imagine taking over this stubborn, rebellious people who have been wandering around the desert for 40, 40 uh, years. Imagine this. And yet he says to them, he, when Moses summons Joshua, he says to him in sight of all of Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with the people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. That's our Lord, the same Lord who walked with Moses and Joshua and every follower after, including you and I. This is who we belong to. It's amazing how God uses things, and I've long since uh, I've long since st uh, stopped. I've long since stopped believing. Okay, I'll just say it this way: I've stopped believing in coincidences. I've been doing this too long to see God line things up in ways that you just go, "Praise God." And this, then, as we approach the end of this series, as we're reading through this book, as we've had funerals all through this. We've had two funerals, uh, book ending last week's, uh, last week's section on uh, when you are dying, and we have another one on the way. And when you wade into funerals, especially with those whom you love, then you start to think and reflect. And I've been so thankful for the things that he has taught, and I had an aha moment with Betty's funeral service. Because, I don't know if you knew this, but Betty had a lot of grandchildren. Did you know this? I was, I mean, I knew she had a lot of a family, but I didn't know how many. I'm gonna see if I could do this right. She had five children, 24 grandchildren, 52 or 50 some great grandchildren, and 14 great, great grandchildren. For a total of, I believe, if my math is correct, 92 or 94, I'm doing this off memory children and grandchildren. And so the church was full, for those of you who are here. I'm not, I, don't, I don't know if I've ever been to a funeral where at least half of the entire sanctuary was full of family. And they were sitting here, all of them. And I shared with the congregation that Betty used to bring up these family members often in our conversations. And she used to, uh, we used to pray for them. We used to talk through their problems and, and all the rest. And then I said this to him, that Betty would always end every, she did this more than just in these moments, but she would always end these conversations with, well, they just need to get to church. And the aha moment I had is that what Betty meant when she said that was that this is the place where she would come and walk with who? Jesus. Now she hadn't made the connections for them probably. Her, she did what many of, of my generation and older do, was we just kind of summarize the entire experience with you need to be where? Church. But we probably live in a time with all these grandchildren gathered that the connections have to be made now explain what is at church. 
that has been so valuable to you and who is at church and what he has done for you. <laughs> I do not believe that the congregation of Zion Lutheran Church is going to fix all the problems of all the people that come here. That's impossible. And to be honest, none of us live up to that. We fail one another. We hurt one another. This church is imperfect because it's full of imperfect people. But our Lord, whom we gather around, is perfect. And he is forgiving. And he sustains. And he gives gifts. And he strengthens us. And we get to come to a place like this and point to him. That is the victory that we have. It all hinges upon him. And we know this. And so that's why we come here. But everyone else needs this too. The good news is you have him. You have him firmly because he has called you by his blood and by name into his family. You are a royal priesthood. You are the family of Christ. You are the body of our very Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You hold him up in front of you, and your life is a witness to him. And your greatest witness will most likely be your death. Because in that moment, when your body is dead, about to be returned to the ground, our hope is that he is risen. And I started to say it and was like, they're going to say it back. <laughs> but our hope is that he is risen. And for us, that makes all the difference because we too will rise. That's what victory looks like. It looks like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I leave you with these words of scripture. As we conclude our sermon series, as we resume some normalcy kind of here in life, we return. We go to John, 1 John chapter 5, which we've already read here today, but I want to read the last two verses. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Amen? Amen. We pray. Almighty God, your word is cast like seed into the ground. Now let the dew of heaven descend and righteous fruit abound. Amen.